All right, here we are, the moment of truth. We're finally going to learn how to use mass spectrometry to identify the formula for an unknown molecule. Now, actually, there's all kinds of different tricks that you can use to identify compounds by mass spectrometry. This isn't even the easiest one of the set, but it's one that I find to be quite interesting in the sense that we're just using the mass. Usually we use things like fragment information, and that's like topics for later on in this course. But right now we're using a mass spectrum. We're just determining the mass of an unknown and we're gonna figure out what our compound is. Now that's not even completely true because we're not just going to use the mass. We're gonna use everything that we've used in the course so far. More specifically, we're gonna use the isotopes and a couple more simple hints that we can use. But before we get into that, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more history. All right, let's go way back now into the 1700s, before there was even such a thing as organic chemistry and analytical chemistry. There was just chemistry, and in fact, it was even a question mark what was going on then. So one of the early precursors to the type of chemistry that we understand now uh, was developed by Antoine Lavoisier. And what we're looking at here is the law of conservation of mass, where what he did was he burned organic compounds in that sort of glassware that you see over there. And what he discovered was that the mass that was produced on the back end, in other words, the reaction products, were equal in mass to what we started with. So that's a pretty straightforward premise, but at the time, it was a rather important discovery. Now, you've probably heard about Lavoisier, but I'm not sure if you've heard of this fellow right here. Justus von Liebig. At least, that's what I think the pronunciation is. <laughs> Forgive me if I butchered that. But uh, this gentleman has had a lot to do with early forms of organic chemistry analysis. So in other words, being able to figure out the formula for an unknown compound. The story that I'm gonna tell you actually has to do with that object right over there. I know I thought it was just simply a triangle, but it's not. On the ACS logo, in the middle, there's what looks like some type of odd glassware. And in fact, that is exactly what it is. So this is the device that we're looking at. It's called a Kaliaparad. And it was a device that was developed by Liebig to assist in the determination of unknowns. So you've probably already learned this before, but if you combust an organic molecule in the presence of oxygen, you're going to produce a certain amount of CO2 and some water. Now the mass of CO2 that's released is going to be proportional to how much carbon we have in our starting compound. But the question comes down, how do you actually weigh that? Well, CO2 is a gas, which means you have to trap that gas. And that's what the device over here is for. So after we're burning our compound, the fumes basically flow through this bubble. And then you can see that they'd be captured in the base because that KOH, potassium hydroxide, will react with the CO2 to produce potassium carbonate. And that's actually where the term Kaliaparad comes from because Kali refers to potash, caustic. So it's all kind of in the name of the chemicals that we're using. So once you've trapped the CO2, what you'd need to do is weigh it. Now, remember the dates that we're dealing at. This is like the early 1800s. So the analytical balances that were available at the time were pretty old fashioned. So these were the types of machines you really had to be patient about. You can imagine that uh, your sample would be put up on a scale and it's just sort of weighing, teetering back and forth because it's, it's an old fashioned balance. So this is the type of instrument that would literally take hours to perform a single measurement on. Now there's a little bit more to the story than this. As you see, at the time, when you think about a university structure, this is the type of lecture that you would imagine. So you have everybody sort of crammed into a theater and the professor at the front, who's sort of the authority on all things smart, uh, just talks and you listen. Uh, maybe there was a textbook to go around with that. But for the most part, this is how science was learned. But science isn't really best learned that way. We all know that science is best learned when you're in a lab. So Liebig was a huge proponent of this. In fact, he developed the entire idea of teaching chemistry in a laboratory setting. Before that, it was just lectures, but he was the one that took his students and put them in the lab to do experiments. So basically, everybody in the lab had one of these Kaliaparats. They were all working on unknowns. They were all identifying compounds. And Liebig became actually a prolific author. He identified like all kinds of different compounds because he had a team of scientists all working collectively with him. And I guess this picture over here shows his team of students uh, after a long day's work. And I, I just find it hilarious that they're all smoking big pipes here at the end of the day. 
And oh yeah, I can't mention uh, Liebig's work without mentioning this here as well. So Liebig actually founded the OXO Cube Company. You know that salt cube, this like beef bouillon, that kind of thing. There's a nice video that explains that. I'll put a link to it that you can see why this is an important fact for Liebig as well. So if you've been through a first year chemistry course, you might not have gone through the history, but I'm sure you've done the work that Liebig has presented to you. So you have this compound, you do combustion analysis, and you determine CO2, you, you end up getting the formula, or at least the empirical formula, through that sort of standard old school process. But today, when it comes to formula determination, we're almost always going to be using mass spectrometry. So this became the theme of a lab that we put together where you're basically using mass spectrometry, that device over there, to identify an unknown based solely on the mass spectrum. So I'll give this mass spectrum to you, and we're gonna go through it and say, how can we identify what the formula is, what the identity of this unknown is, just from what you see right there. So one thing that you can see right away is the isotopes. And the isotopes provide us very clear information, which is the Z in the M over Z scale. So you'll notice that the gap between them, 304, 305, 305, the gap is one. So that means that the charge state of this molecule has to be one. So that's important information to put in our back pocket right away. And as far as the mass, well, it's not just 304. We do have all these other decimal places to work with as well. So the mass that we can report here is actually 304.1512. All those extra digits are going to be very useful to us. However, as we've been talking about in our previous videos, we know that that mass is not absolute. If we were to run this again, we might get a range of values. So depending on the mass accuracy of our instrument, there's going to be an uncertainty with that mass. And we need to know what that uncertainty is. So here I'm just claiming that this instrument has a mass accuracy of 20 ppm. So it means that we're going to have an acceptable mass somewhere in the range. Now I'm drawing that way inflated from what it really would be. But the mass range that we can get here provides us with this sort of plus or minus. So we're going to say that our compound will have a mass anywhere within that range. So I like the analogy here. Our goal is to really hit the target as closely as possible. And the more accurate you will be, the more you'll eliminate the possibilities. If we could know that mass to like infinite number of decimal places, we would know the formula right away. The closer we get, the better we get. So an instrument that provides you with high mass accuracy that can hit the target every single time is going to give us uh, less, possible, uh, less possible choices on what the formula might be. All right, before we go on here, we're gonna still take a look at the spectrum and decide what more information can we learn from it. So let's go back to the isotopes. I think what you should be able to notice is that we could probably eliminate a few elements especially chlorine and bromine, right? Because we know that they have like an obvious pattern. The, the, the M plus two isotope would be much higher than that. So we know we can eliminate those. I'm not sure if you picked up right away, but we can also eliminate sulfur. Sulfur at the M plus two would be about 4% in intensity. So that's, that's something that's less obvious to see. But if you are looking at that spectrum, you can decide quite quickly that sulfur is not among the possible elements that makes up this compound. All right, what else do we have? Well, if you look at the M plus one isotope, we can get information about the number of carbons. So if we're just saying that it's roughly 20%, it doesn't even matter if it's exactly 20, but just, you know, just eyeballing it, it looks like it's about 20%. And if we just take that number and divide it by 1.1, our shortcut formula for the number of carbons, we get about 18 or so carbons. I'd actually be comfortable to say it's anywhere from uh, like 15 to 20. That's that's maybe even being a little bit too generous there, but the 20% for the intensity is just a pretty rough estimate. So that's roughly how many carbons we should have in the molecule. So we previously said that the charge was plus one. Now, this is important information, which is stressed here, but how was this particular spectrum recorded? In other words, what mode of ionization did we use? So if I were to say that this is electrospray ionization, then more than likely the charge state comes from a protonation event. So we're actually looking at M plus H. And the mass of the compound would no longer be what we actually observe. We now have to account for the mass of the proton. It's not one, remember? So if we were to subtract off the exact mass of our proton, 
we could calculate the mass of our molecule. So if we subtract off the mass of the proton, and remember it's not exactly one, it's, it's 1.007825, but if we take that number off, we're going to get the mass of the unprotonated or sort of the, the normal state of that molecule. It's still going to have that uncertainty, the plus or minus 20 ppm. So we still have to apply that to the number. And still there's one more piece of information. So you might already know this from an organic class, but this is something that's really important to us as well. So you notice the mass that we're dealing with is an odd number. That odd number can be applied to what we call the nitrogen rule. So the nitrogen rule is pretty simple. It's more of a, an empirical observation, but it comes from the fact that when you're dealing with kind of a, a regular organic compound that has the usual suspects thrown into it, then an odd mass corresponds to an odd number of nitrogens. And likewise, if your mass has an even number, then there should be an even number of nitrogens. It's important that you're applying that by removing the proton first, because that mass 304, that's not really the mass of the molecule. But a mass of 303 means that we must have an odd number of nitrogens in this unknown molecule. So with all that information, we can finally go to this program, ChemCalc, and we're going to use that information to hopefully whittle down the identity of the unknown compound. So let's click through here. So we go to the Molecular Finder tool, and we're going to enter the mass. In this case, I'm entering the mass without the proton. I find that a little bit easier. Uh, right away the list is pretty long. It actually went all the way up to 200 possibilities, but wait, I didn't enter the ppm. So that was defaulted to 500. Our instrument is only down to 20 ppm, so we narrow it down. Still a long list. Now the, un the other thing that's missing here is that nitrogen rule. So you notice the column degree of unsaturations, the 9.5, the, the, these fractionals, those still count. Just click the box right here and you're basically applying the nitrogen rule. I also said there was about 18 carbons and you just look across the list, that's the only one that, that kind of comes even close to it. So I'm gonna take that as my possible formula. I'm just curious what that compound might be. So if I paste this in, hey, check out what I get. So does that mean that we've identified cocaine from this mass spectrum? Well, no, like I said, there might be more possibilities but it certainly fits the bill. To really get at the identification of our unknown, we would have to go through further testing. But right now, we got pretty strong evidence that says once you've recorded that mass spectrum, the formula that we've determined is actually bang on correct. That is the correct formula. I'm just not saying for sure that that formula corresponds to cocaine. By the way, it did. Like when we do these experiments, we actually sort of get the students to analyze a compound. They don't know what it is, but we're just handing them a little bit of cocaine. Not very much. And, you know, don't worry. This isn't a crazy university out in, on the east coast of Canada here. But um, you can buy these as, as reference materials. We're spiking like less than a microgram. It's like less than the mass that sits on a fingerprint. I should show you that kind of stuff before. And this actually forms the basis of a, an article that we published. It's in the Journal of Chemical Education, and it basically walks you through how to perform this type of experiment. You don't need to have a mass spectrometer. You can produce these spectra artificially, but it's kind of fun to do this in the lab to actually record the spectrum and say, hey, this is what I've got. But anyways, in a nutshell, that is how we use the mass information as well as the isotopes and a few more little tricks up our sleeve to figure out the formula for an unknown compound. And that wraps up this video and all the topics for this week. So we'll see you around next time.